Welcome once again to our Leaders of Change Kingdom Lifestyle Bible Teaching. We are teaching on the books of the Bible. Continue from last week, which we, we spoke about Abraham. But today we are talking about the book of Exodus. And I pray that your hearts are receptive and open to what God is saying to you. And I know for sure he always has a word for those in need. So we allow the Holy Spirit right now to have its way. And I pray that you are blessed what's being said through my husband's lips, my husband Ian, I am Janet. And we give God praise, honor, and glory for everything he has done in our life, doing right now, for the special he's about to do. So be blessed and we give God praise for his word is life and truth. My dear, you want to So today we're going to be looking at the book of Exodus and last time as we uh, turn the last pages of Genesis we see God working toward the fulfillment of his promises to Abraham. Joseph had been taken to Egypt as a slave and had risen to second in line after Pharaoh. During the famine in the promised land Jacob and his family had moved to Egypt and subsequently their numbers had grown significantly in line with God's promise that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. However, as Exodus opens, we see that there was a new generation that had arisen that did not know Joseph, and the Egyptians had enslaved the children of Israel out of fear of them taking over their country. So the title of the book, Exodus, is derived from the Greek word exodus, which is used in the Septuagint, meaning exit or departure, referring to God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt and their departure from Egypt as the people of God. There are two possible dates for the Exodus. What is called the, the biblical date, which is about 1445 BC, which uh, is based on uh, Judges 1126 and 1 Kings 6 1, or a later date of about 1290 BC, proposed by liberal critics based on assumptions about the Egyptian rulers and archaeological dating for the destruction of Canaanite cities during the conquest while modern critics question the historicity of it all together. Who is the author of Exodus? Well, there are two theories. Modern critics view the book as a work of various editors as a much later date than Moses, which is known as the GEDP theory. This theory avoids the prophecy of Genesis 15, 13, 14, which says, Then the Lord said to him, Know for sure that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation. They serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. By claiming that the books were written after these events, a common trend in modern critics to avoid the prophetic content of scripture. However, Jewish tradition from the time of Joshua onwards, plus the testimony of Jesus, early Christianity and contemporary conservative scholarship all attribute the book's origin to Moses. Internal evidence supports Moses' authorship. Numerous details indicate the author was an eyewitness of the recorded events. So the first two chapters of Exodus cover 400 years. We quickly read over the descriptions of the Israelites making Pharaoh's bricks and building Pharaoh's cities, yet overlook the fact that this had been going on for a long time. These short, uh, two short chapters summarize a huge amount of suffering. Understandably, the Israelites seem to have given up hope by this point. After all, they were forced to continue in backbreaking labor, day after day, generation after generation, without any indication that it would end. So this raises an important question. Was God really keeping his promises to Abraham if his descendants were slaves in Egypt? And the answer is an uncategorical yes. 
As we've seen in Genesis 15, 13 to 14, God specifically told Abraham that this would happen. God's promises to Abraham were exactly on track. And as the book of Exodus opens, the scene is being set for the greatest act of redemption the world had seen to this point. Here we find God's people in an impossible situation without any hope of relief. If God is going to keep his promises to Abraham, then he will have to accomplish something spectacular. As it turns out, God's display of power in Israel's exodus is frequently mentioned in the rest of the Bible as clear evidence of God's commitment to his people and his power to redeem. Adding to the agony of slavery, Pharaoh commanded that all male Hebrew babies were to be drowned in the Nile River. It's at this seemingly hopeless time that we meet Moses. By his mother's cunning and God's provision, Moses survived the slaughter. At this vulnerable moment at the beginning of his life, no one could have predicted how greatly God would use Moses. After Moses' mother saved him by floating him down the Nile in a basket, Pharaoh's daughter discovered, raised and educated him. Though trained in the house of Pharaoh, it seems that Moses deeply understood his connection to the nation of Israel. In fact, it was an early attempt to fight for his people by murdering an Egyptian that led Moses to flee to the wilderness. But during this period of exile, God was preparing to rescue his people from slavery. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Exodus 2, 23 to 25. It's important to recognise that, that what God was about to do here was directly related to his covenant with Abraham. Though the situation seemed entirely hopeless, God saw his people and he knew. Just as he did with Abraham, God chose to begin this next phase of redemptive history through one man, Moses. As Moses tended his father-in-law's sheep in the wilderness, Moses had an unforgettable encounter with God, an event that changed his life and shapes our understanding of who God is. And we read in uh, Exodus chapter 3, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. 
the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to them, to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorable, disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and every woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. When Moses saw the burning bush, he walked closer to see what was going on. As he approached, he heard the voice of God telling him to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. As God revealed his plan to use Moses to set Israel free, Moses asked God two questions. The first question was, who am I? Who am I, God, that you would send me a stammering shepherd to defy a powerful king and lead your people? The second question was, who are you? When people ask who sent me, what should I tell them? But Moses was backpedaling from what God was calling him to do. These are both excellent questions. They are the most fundamental questions we could ever ask, because everything in our lives, not only here and now, but for all of eternity, is based on a right answer to those two questions. One, who am I? And two, who is God? God answered Moses' first question by pointing to himself. Moses asked, who am I? And God simply replied, I will be with you. God's response at this point should be fundamental to the way we view ourselves. From the very beginning, God's people are known as those whose God is with them. We belong to him. And there's no way that we can define ourselves apart from God. It is his presence with us that enables us to accomplish the tasks he gives us. In response to Moses' second question, who are you? God said very simply, I am who I am. This is not a dismissive statement, it's very significant, and there's much to be learned from this declaration. God was explaining that he cannot define himself by pointing to anyone or anything else. The name I am speaks of his eternality, whereas an appropriate name to describe us would be I became or I was brought into existence. God's name is I am because he has always existed. He is who he is, and that is who he will always be. This is a statement of absolute being, absolute power, absolute importance. God is who he is, and he never changes. When we examine the creation account of God's personal name used in Genesis 2, we see that name is Yahweh, translated in most English Bibles as the Lord, with all capital letters, a name that comes from this statement to Moses. Yahweh carries the significance of God's statement to Moses, I am who I am. The name Yahweh is actually used over 6,000 times in the Old Testament, three times as often as the simple name for God, Elohim, which is the title for God used in Genesis 1. The implication of this frequent use of God's personal name is that God aims to be known in Scripture, not just as a generic deity, but as a specific person with a wholly unique character and a special relationship with his people. It's impossible to convey exactly what this encounter must have been like for Moses. He walked away from his sheep because he saw something remarkable, a bush that was burning without being consumed, but he had no idea that he was actually walking into the presence of the living God. God immediately commanded Moses to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. As soon as Moses saw what was really happening, he hid his face. God's holiness was more than he could bear. All he could do was listen and obey. God then sent Moses back to Egypt to lead his people out of slavery. 
and into the land that he promised to give Abraham's descendants. When Moses arrived, he gave Pharaoh a simple command from God. Let my people go. Not only did Pharaoh refuse to let Israel go free, he intensified their labour to the point that the Israelites got angry at Moses for provoking Pharaoh. Even Moses himself seemed to have lost heart at this point. But God continued to carry out his plan of redemption, showing his resolve to keep his covenant with Abraham and to free his people from bondage. We read again in uh, Exodus 5.22, going through uh, into chapter 6. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you've not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand. He will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Israelites are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labour. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites would not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. We need to understand that this battle is nothing short of a showdown between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and Pharaoh, the supposed son of the sun god Ra. The Egyptians earnestly believed that their king was a god, and as such he was responsible for maintaining order in their natural world. When God used Moses to deliver the ten plagues, he was dem demonstrating his absolute power over everything that Egypt's god king claimed control over. Many of the plagues seemed to have been directed against specific Egyptian deities, for example, the plague of darkness would have been an embarrassment to Ra, the sun god, but all of them would have undermined Pharaoh's claims to deity. Just as we saw in the accounts of creation, the flood and the Tower of Babel, we are seeing that God controls every aspect of the world he created, and he will not share his authority with anyone. He fights for his own glory and proves that he is the ultimate power and only true God. Though God clearly demonstrated his power over Pharaoh and all of Egypt's gods through the first nine plagues, it was the tenth plague that ultimately got Pharaoh's attention. God warned that unless Pharaoh released his people, every firstborn in the land of Egypt would be killed. Tragically, Pharaoh refused and the consequences were devastating. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Exodus 12, 29 through 30. It's difficult to imagine such a scene, but it teaches us an important lesson about God. Just as he is faithful to keep his promises of blessing, God is also faithful to carry out his warnings of wrath. This is important to keep in mind in a time when so many doubt and even ridicule God's intention to punish. 
Notice that God had graciously offered the Egyptians an alternative before he got to this point. Pharaoh could have submitted to God's call and his nation would have been preserved. God also provided an alternative for the Israelites. Any Israelite who put the blood of a lamb on their doorpost would be passed over. The angel of death would move on to the next house. <coughs> for us today, it's hard to imagine what this would have been like for the Israelites, as we do not slaughter our food anymore. We buy it prepackaged and ready to eat. But bringing a lamb into your house and slaughtering it and then taking its blood, and as your children watch, you wipe it across the doorpost over your home. That's an image that stays with you for a very long time. And imagine your young child, either a young boy or girl, asking, why did you do that, Daddy? And your response would be, the lamb was a substitute. Instead of someone in our family dying, the lamb died. Look at your brother and realise that the lamb died instead of him. The stark reality of that night is that the only people who were exempt from judgment were those who put blood on their doorposts and in so doing trusted that death would pass over them. It's not that the Israelites didn't experience God's judgment because they were better people. They escaped God's judgment simply because they trusted in the sacrifice by God, provided by God. And everyone, even slaves who trusted in that sacrifice, was spared on that night. This is the picture we see throughout Scripture. And it's important to keep in mind when we read about God's covenant with Moses and the laws that God gave to govern his people. Keep in mind that from the very beginning, the only way to receive forgiveness was through trusting the forgiver. The only way to be a recipient of the promises of God is to trust God. The people were saved only because they trusted God as they saw the blood of a spotless lamb over their doorposts. This night was the first Passover, an event that the Jews have celebrated once a year ever since. It's full of significance that Jesus on the night he was betrayed recast the Passover celebration in terms of his own death and resurrection. Jesus could hardly have been clearer that he was laying down his life for his followers as their Passover lamb. Paul makes this connection explicit in the New Testament where he told us, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Though the death of every firstborn in Egypt convinced Pharaoh to release the Israelites, he soon changed his mind and chased after them. This provided the backdrop for one of the, of the most memorable events in salvation history. As Israel sat with their backs to the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army approached rapidly. It seemed certain that their exodus from slavery was over immediately after it began. But nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing can stop him from fulfilling his promises. He proved this by splitting the waters of the Red Sea, allowing his people to walk across on dry land, and then destroying Pharaoh and his army as the waters closed in around them. As God redeemed his people by leading them out of slavery, he demonstrated in dramatic fashion that Israel's God is like any other other so-called God. And yet after God's incredible deliverance, we should take note of Israel's long-term reaction. What did they do time and again in response to God's redemptive grace? They forgot. They complained. They longed for the days when they were back in Egypt. How could this people who had so clearly seen God's hand at work stop trusting God and begin complaining about their circumstances? But before we become too critical of the Israelites, let's look at our own lives. We may not have been saved from an oncoming army by walking through the sea on dry land, but those events are part of our heritage. Not only that, but we've seen God come through for us in incredibly powerful and personal ways. No matter what we try to make ourselves believe in our darkest moments, everyone has unmistakably seen the hand of God in our lives. But we forget, we complain, we lose our trust in God and try to go back to doing the things our own way. We need to take some time to learn from Israel's example and focus on remembering God's provision in life's most difficult circumstances. He is still the I am that I am. And as we remember the Passover, and that it was only by applying the blood on the doors, um, lintels, that uh, the people in those houses were saved. It's only by applying the blood of our Passover lamb, that of Jesus Christ, that we are saved today. It's... Uh, sacrifice that was made for everybody and it's available for everybody but unfortunately not everybody makes that decision to accept that sacrifice and if we don't accept that sacrifice then we're going to be like the Egyptians we won't be covered by the blood and we will face the God's judgment but accepting Jesus Christ and his uh, saviour is just the beginning 
of life of a, um, a leadership uh, change, to be a leader of change. We're not just followers of Christ. The disciples were followers of Christ when Christ was on this earth. But when Christ went back into heaven through the ascension, the disciples changed from being followers to becoming leaders. And so it's up to all of us as believers that while we follow Jesus Christ, we need to be leading others towards him, towards eternal safety. We need to be applying the blood of Jesus Christ to the doorpost of other people's lives. So this is an opportunity for us to be refreshed and re-energized. Just as after the uh, children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they celebrated in song and dance and celebration. It's a time as we approach Easter that we need to be, have that same um, emotion of celebration. Because Jesus Christ has done a great thing for us. He's, done a, he's given us all a great gift. But, you know, God tells us that we shouldn't hoard our resources. We shouldn't hoard our gifts. And what is the worst thing that we could possibly hoard is the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that he came into this earth to save each and every one of us. It doesn't matter what colour we are, or how wealthy we are, our backgrounds, even what religions we are. Jesus came to save each and every one of us. So this is the time now that we need to pray together, for a revival of the Holy Spirit. And we need to be energised and learn new ways in these pandemic times of how to share with other people the, the saving word of the salvation, of the gospel of salvation. That's why Jesus came back to the earth, to tell us about the kingdom of God and how we access the kingdom of God. As he told Nicodemus in John 3.16, that whosoever believe in the Son of God shall not die but have eternal life. We need to be born again, to be born of the Spirit. And that's the challenge that we have today as we end this message, is that we need to be re-energised by the Holy Spirit with the love of God to go out and share this great gift God has given to mankind, the gift of Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour of our lives. I want to add my part. Um, and coming on ending our session, we're praying for the body of Christ to come back together, unite as one in Christ. Because the harvest is ripe, but the labors are few. So as leaders, all of us are called leaders actually, because God has put great potentials in us to be able to accomplish every assignment, every mission on our lives. But whose hand does he have but our hand to do it? And whose feet does he have to go than our feet? But yet, during critical and obstacles that comes our way, our faith at times tend to deter or weaken. So we pray right now that God will awaken us in areas that need awakening, quicken our spirits so we'll be more attentive to what he's saying in these end times. Because his word did say, judgment first begins on the house of God. You and I know what we're called to do. Even if we have fallen short, and God understands, but yet he said, repent and come back to me and I will forgive and I will heal and deliver you because all things are possible with me. But yet I look at the heart of man and there's nothing hidden from God's eyes. It's not a word that we have said in our heart. He has not heard it. He is an all sovereign almighty omnipotent God he's God of passion he's God of mercy he's a forgiving God he is the great I am he is all that we we want him to be he's sovereign he is omnipotent 
He is gracious. But most of all, he loves us unconditionally. Now he wants us to come back to him. Rekindling the fire we once knew when we first got saved. I say, yes, Father. I thank you for receiving me once again. And for your sweet spirit to establish me and position me where I should be back in your kingdom. Because it's not over until God says over. So I thank you, Father, right now for the sacrificial life that Jesus has demonstrated for all of us because all have sinned and come short. So, Father, I thank you right now, even as we open our hearts to be receptive to what you are saying. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. Because you alone deserve it. That's the reason why you created us, Father. To bring glory and honor to your name. And all the angels in heaven rejoice, praise, because they know that you are holy. And besides you, there's none else. You're the God of all gods. And all power is yours. So we thank you, Father, for receiving what we present to you. First of all, ourselves. Continue to cleanse us. Continue to heal us and deliver us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.